Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. We're going to be starting the forum in less than 10 minutes, so please enjoy your coffee, but uh, come into the forum, and we'll be starting in a uh, less, little less than 10 minutes. So you're going to hear Dr. Bergerson tell us about the upcoming election, the Electoral College, and items relative to the coming 2024 election. Hi, Keith. We'll begin in just a few minutes, so please come into the sanctuary. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to today's uh, forum. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to once again welcome Dr. Peter Bergerson to our forum. His career spans 55 years of teaching at the university level, including since 2002 at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Florida Gulf Coast University where he'll be an adjunct professor starting in the fall. His areas of specialization include public administration, public policy, U.S. government institutions, administrative law, public budgeting, public personnel administration, federalism, and judicial policy. He's published a number of books and articles on these various subjects. In his remarks today, Dr. Bergerson will discuss the role and history of the Electoral College, which is what elects the, pop elects the president, not the pop it is not the popular vote that elects the president. And he'll present the current political landscape seven months before the September, before the November general election. 
So let's welcome Dr. Peter Burgesson, please. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you very much, Dick. Can you all hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, thank you. You know, it's uh, really great to be back here. This is perhaps the um, fourth or fifth time that I've had the opportunity to speak, and uh, I've enjoyed every uh, opportunity that I've been here. And um, I, I remember with really a, a warm heart uh, flow, uh, she, she um, uh, re really is a special person, as you know, and, and, and someone who, who I really uh, respected and, and, and loved. Anyway, um, uh, as uh, Dick was so nice to say, uh, uh, I've had a, a, a wonderful career uh, teaching uh, uh, political science and particularly campaigns and elections, and that will be the course that I'll be uh, teaching as an adjunct this fall at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. And the, as we know, uh, most, uh, most people uh, think that when they are voting on November the 5th, they're voting for the President of the United States. And in reality, they're not. Uh, here in Florida, uh, they're voting for, as they are in every state, they're voting for party electors. And Florida uh, <clears throat> happens to have 50. Uh, each state and the District of Columbia has the same number of electors as they have members of the House and Senate. So Florida has 28 members of the U.S. House, two senators, that gives us 50 electoral college votes. And <clears throat> So today, I'm going to talk about the little of the history of the Electoral College, and perhaps why we have it, and then where, where do we stand today uh, in, in relationship to the campaign and what to uh, keep in mind as we move forward to uh, a voting uh, here in, in November. And so uh, the, uh, why do we have the Electoral College? Uh, we have the Electoral College uh, because of the principle of federalism, and that is that the uh, writers of the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, <coughs> wanted to involve the states. You know, originally, uh, the, uh, the, the Constitution we have today was not the first. We had the Articles of Confederation, and under the Articles of Confederation, why the states were the dominant uh, factor in the political structure of the United States. And so when it came time to uh, develop the new constitution, write the new constitution, the states had a, a, a very important role in it. And so that's one of the reasons. Another is the, the distrust for uh, the, the uh, executive power. They had uh, obviously lived under of uh, the authoritarian regime of, uh, uh, of the King of England, and they wanted to have some way of, of checking uh, the, the, uh, the power of the executive. Uh, <clears throat> they, they also uh, had some concern about the idea of uh, the, absolute, the voters voting. And so having the, this intermediary process uh, uh, frankly, it's, uh, as it unfolds, it's, it's really a very uh, Byzantine uh, process that has a, a, a lots of discretion involved in actually choosing the president. But anyway, the, they didn't trust the voters. And <clears throat> subsequently, there also was a question of, of how to deal with uh, the southern states and the question of, of slavery. And this is where the, you know, the Three-Fifths Amendment came in uh, to the Constitution. So these are, are some of the uh, factors involved in why we have the Electoral College. Not the only one, but uh, I have another theory that uh, I'll explain perhaps a little later uh, if, we, if we have time. And, and let me also mention that if anyone has any questions at any time, raise your hand, stand up, 
whatever, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll do my best to, to try to answer them for you. So <clears throat> how does the Electoral College uh, shapes the presidential election? Well, <clears throat> as you can see, the Constitution uh, in, in the Article 2 in the 12th Amendment provides, uh, does not provide for the pop, I mean, the popular vote does not choose the president. And <clears throat> each state, uh, as I mentioned, has the same number of electors who, that related to the members of the, the House and the Senate. And so <clears throat> what will happen uh, is, and, and it, it, we'll go through this in a little earlier, from a, a, a brief historical perspective, uh, the first uh, presidential election didn't even involve a popular vote. Uh, George Washington was elected uh, by electors, and the electors were appointed by the state legislatures, which and even today, they, they still are. There, there was no popular vote. Uh, the state electors, uh, the, the state legislatures chose the electors, sent them to Washington, uh, and uh, George Washington was elected uh, unanimously. Uh, in, and so who are the electors? Uh, the, the electors, and there's not... There's not one slate of electors, but what happens is each political party in each state has a slate of electors. So here in Florida, there'll be a slate of 30 Republican electors, and there'll be a slate of 30 Democratic electors, and there'll be a slate of, if there are other, you know, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., as he gets on the ballot here, and whatever, uh, third party for whatever, each party has a potential slate of electors. And they're chosen at a state convention. So in this summer, uh, it, it usually it's in, in uh, early, early July or, or late June, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and others they have a statewide convention here in Florida. And one of the things that they do at the, that convention is that they select 30 potential presidential electors. And the stipulation is that they cannot be federal office holders. They could be state office holders. In fact, um, four years ago, uh, the the uh, 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 local state represent uh, state senator uh, <clears throat> he was one of the Republican uh, electors uh, to the that that uh, uh, went went to vote for uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, yes Trump in uh, in two thousand so anyway the 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 slate of electors is who we're really voting for in November. And it's not, it is, is not, uh, each party has this slate of electors. The popular vote in November is what determines which electors will be chosen. And historically, that list in some states was actually on the ballot. So you, you would know who the electors you were voting for, who in turn, they would vote for their party's nominee. In, 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 order, to win, in, in order to win a state electors, you just need the plurality of the popular vote. You do not need a majority. And so, for instance, uh, as, as perhaps some of you recall, in 2000, uh, uh, yeah, 2000, uh, George W. Bush won here in Florida by 538 votes. He did not win the majority of the vote here in Florida, but he won the highest number of votes. And uh, my students often ask, 
what's the difference between a majority and a plurality. Uh, I don't bore you necessarily, but obviously the plurality just means the highest number, majority means 51%. And so <clears throat> the plurality of the popular vote, and it's a winner take all. So if you win by 538 electoral college votes, I mean by, by 530 popular vote, you get them all. Now there's two states that have exceptions to that, and that's Maine and Nebraska. And <clears throat> Nebraska just this last week tried to change it. Uh, Nebraska has five electoral college votes, and they, uh, anyone here from Nebraska originally? Yeah, well, you, we probably know them that they divide their electoral college votes by congressional districts. And then, and, and so historically, at least in recent times, uh, five of those, uh, four of the five were Republican and one was a Democrat, and they tried to change it and it, it failed. Yeah. Well, only only by voting for them in the in the actual selection process. No, and no, it, it's purely a party. It, it the the selection of who that who's involved in that slate is determined by the party, and those individuals are usually. Uh, party regulars, party stalwarts, uh, major contributors, individuals who have a long history of engagement in, in the party. And, and so the elector has no leeway in terms of voting differently than the party. They, I mean, they couldn't vote. Are they free to vote for whomever they want? Yeah. Yes, they, the, yeah, the, I, hopefully you all heard the question is that is, uh, when, when the electors go to the state capitol, it, it, it's a private vote, and there are oftentimes, not many, but there are, are what has been called unfaithful electors. And uh, e even though, even though the state law oftentimes requires them to vote for the person who won, there, there's no way of knowing because it's a private vote. It's a secret ballot. And, you know, um, I, 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 one particular that I can recall, and that perhaps is uh, maybe somewhat appropriate here on a Sunday, is that in 1960, uh, there were... Um, <clears throat> um, I'm not good at this modern technology. Uh, yeah, and in fact, my. I, I have hearing it. Let me give you. We'll get some. Or I, I, I can just hold this too. The. Uh, in 1960, there were so, several uh, Southern electors, uh, Alabama or Mississippi, uh, who refused to vote for uh, President-elect Kennedy. Uh, I'll, I'll use this. This is okay. okay. Uh, refused to vote for President Kennedy because he was a Catholic. And they thought for sure that the Pope was going to move to the White House. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, <clears throat> so the, I hope that, does that answer your, your, your question? Or if any, any others, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, I want to move along here. And, it, uh, and so the electors, <clears throat> what happens is after the election on November the 5th, the Secretary of State in Florida, as in all states, will certify the winner. And they will certify this to the state legislature as these are the duly elected electors. 
And the electors then <coughs> will, uh, the November 5th election, uh, in, in December 11th, uh, the, the, the governor determines uh, who these are based on the, the recommendation of the Secretary of State. Then on, uh, is it the seventh, no, uh, keep this in mind, on December the 17th, this year coming up, the uh, 30 electors who will be chosen, they will meet in Tallahassee at the state capitol and they will vote for one candidate for president and one candidate for vice president. And so <clears throat> this is where, uh, it, it, again, in most cases, uh, they vote for the, the candidate who won the idea of uh, faithless electors is small, but it, it does take place. Uh, <clears throat> th these, uh, uh, I interestingly enough, the, the Constitution requires that the electors vote for people from different states. In other words, th there was recent talk a, a week or two ago uh, Senator Marco Rubio was asked, would, would he like to be the vice pre Trump's vice presidential candidate? Some of you may have seen this, and, and he didn't deny it, and he, he kind of grinned or, uh, you know, puffed his chest and said, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the Constitution uh, doesn't, uh, well, it, he, 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 he could be vice president, but he, could, he couldn't get the 30 electoral college votes from Florida unless either he or Trump moved. And hopefully uh, the, the uh, president, uh, uh, former president, he, he might move. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> so and, and, and as an example of, of this, in, in the year 2000, when George Bush ran uh, for uh, president, his running mate uh, was Dick Cheney, and Dick Cheney was also from Texas. And so Dick Cheney had been a former U.S. congressman from Wyoming, and he had kept a residence out there, up there, and he quietly uh, went back to Wyoming, changed his official registration, registered to vote, got a driver's license, got a fishing license, and uh, I presume a, a firearm, a license to carry a firearm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, he did that to make sure that he would get the electoral college votes from Texas. Uh, it, there was no problem for Bush, but it, again, the electors, this is a small, perhaps, uh, issue, but uh, the vice president and president uh, the electors have to vote for someone from two different states. So <clears throat> what goes on next is the, the, uh, these elect, the 30 electors who are chosen, uh, they go to the uh, state capitol and Congress uh, meets in a joint session of Congress and they uh, count the votes, announce the votes, uh, and uh, Congress certifies the results of the Electoral College. And then on January 20th, uh, normally uh, the president is sworn in without uh, a riot. Uh, oh, if there, it, it goes to the House of Representatives, yeah. Has there ever been a time when nationally uh, a candidate won the popular vote but did not win the electoral college vote. Yes, sure. Okay. There, there's been a, a, a 2000 would be a good example of it. 2016 would be another good example of it. 2000, uh, the, the uh, popular vote went to uh, Al Gore, uh, but uh, George W. Bush uh, won the White House. And in 2016, excuse me, Hillary Clinton 
won the popular vote and the, the electoral college vote uh, went, went to, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> uh, Trump. I, 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 I got the sense, uh, uh, speaking here in the past, that uh, most of you have been saved already. So. <laughs> Any other questions? So, what happens? Yeah. Uh, I think I didn't speak loud enough. No, no, wait for the mic so people can hear you. I just very quickly, I, I wasn't clear. The elector, the choice of the electors by the party at their conventions, uh, does an elector have to have been a delegate to the state convention, or can they choose anybody in the state that they think is a faithful voter? I, I'm not sure I understood. The, the, the electors that are chosen at the state convention, if they go, to, they then, if they're elected by the popular vote, they go to vote in the electoral college. Was that your question? Yes, yes, not the national convention, a state convention. Okay, other, uh, uh, yeah. I was wondering about the uh, election of vice president. Uh, from what you said, is it possible to elect a vice president different than what's on the ballot with the current? Yeah, it, sure, it could. Uh, uh, and originally, that was what happened. Uh, the, the, uh, there was an amendment, I think it was the 12th Amendment, changed that. Uh, originally, the president and the vice president, originally the vice president was the runner-up. And so you could imagine today what would it be like if, uh, uh, who would be the vice president today if we hadn't changed that uh, provision in the Constitution. The Electoral College, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, they are sworn for the first vote to vote as they have been assigned. But if there's a second vote, are they free to vote as they wish? Uh, no, I think you have the, the vote at the national conventions confusing with the electoral college vote. The electoral college only votes once, that's it. And what you may be referring to are delegates that will be will go to the national conventions this July. The Republicans will be meeting in Milwaukee, the Democrats in Chicago. Uh, totally different process. It's easy to get them confused because the, they use some of the same terminology. And but no, there's no. No relation. Someone else have a question? Okay. If if no one gets a yeah. you have you have okay yeah sure. Thank you. The uh, the main problem with the electoral college is the inequity of the uh, of the vote uh, uh, the final vote. In this case, uh, the three most underrepresented states are California, Texas, and Florida. Ironically, two of those are red states. But the red states will not change the Constitution because overall they have a huge advantage because of the rural states. Let me ask you, there's a movement nationwide to change this going state by state. If enough states that have 270 votes support this, then it begins to change. And the movement is that each state will give all of its electoral votes to the winner of that state. If enough votes, uh, enough states that have 270 votes agree, then it's a fait accompli. We have, the electoral college is essentially dead. Are you familiar with this movement? Uh, uh, very briefly, um, yeah, but and I'll get to maybe a reason why that's probably not going to happen here in, in just a little bit. Uh, but, but I think we have about uh, uh, 220 uh, 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 
states comprising 220 or 30 electoral votes. They need another 30 or 40, which may not happen, okay? But if it, that did happen, then ipso facto, the Electoral College is toast. Yeah, right. Um, the changing, uh, just briefly, um, the likelihood of changing the Electoral College in any meaningful manner in, in my lifetime is pretty slim. Uh, I, I, I assume most of you, it, you may see it, but uh, I, I know I don't think I will. Uh, anyway, if no one gets a majority or 270 of the 538 electoral college votes, the House of Representatives chooses who the president will be. This has happened twice. If no vice presidential candidate gets 270 electoral college votes, the U.S. Senate chooses the vice president, and this happened, has happened once. So when it goes to the House of Representatives, each state gets one vote. So it, it's, it's not all 435 members of the House. It's one, each state gets one vote. And so in Florida, with the 28 members of the House of Representatives, you have approximately uh, 18 of those are uh, Republican and 10 are uh, Democrats. It's you know pretty obvious who's going to get the one vote from from the House in in Florida. Well, let me <clears throat> let me move on and and talk about. Okay, this this is gives at least a rough idea of the Electoral College. Well, where do we stand today and where will the election unfold between now and November? And here is what I think is a, a reasonable picture of what will happen in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. And these five categories gives you some picture of the political comp levels of political competition between the Republicans and the Democratic Party uh, in each of these states. And so if we, we uh, start over here, whoa. If, there we go. If we start over here, the likelihood of any of that uh, President Biden's going to win any of these states is next to nothing. You know, if he, he if he were to win in Mississippi or Alabama, uh, you know, it, it would be a tsunami. I mean, it would be, and even over here. Uh, uh, the likelihood of, of uh, Biden winning here in Florida, uh, not very good. Uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, you know, I, I would perhaps like to see it different, but, but real. And the same over here. Uh, the likelihood that, that Trump's going to win in, in any of these states is, is, is a pretty much of a foregone conclusion. So someone asked the question, which is a very good one, uh, what, what's the likelihood of change? Uh, what's the likelihood that um, <clears throat> someone, uh, that, that there's going to be a strong enough interest to change this particular uh, situation? Well, it, it, both parties ha have a built-in advantage of nearly uh, 200 electoral college votes. And so what they're really competing for, what they're really competing for are these 93 in these states right here. These are, these are the toss-up states that, <coughs> where the campaign is really going to be, the outcome of the election is going to be determined. And 
let me give you, uh, and, and so either party ne needs approximately 70 of these 93. That, that's, uh, you, you're not gonna see, you're, you're not gonna see uh, Biden sp spending uh, a, a lot of time in, in any of these other states, and the same with Trump. You know, there, there's no need to do it because we, the, the voting patterns are so well established. Well, let me give you a picture of how close it is in, in these particular states. Uh, <clears throat> you have roughly 219, uh, Trump has 219 electoral college votes and Biden has 226. Biden needs 45, Trump needs 51. That's how close the election is, at least today. You know, things may change, uh, but, and, and let me give you just another picture here of how close the election was in 2000 in these particular states. And so you can see, uh, this gives you an idea also of not only how close they were, but why there was a contention, at least uh, uh, by President, uh, at that time, President Trump. That the, um, the, the vote here, for instance, in, in Arizona, you, you can see four-tenths of one percent. You can see here, in, it was three-tenths of one percent of the vote. And so <clears throat> this is where this is where the campaign will be won or lost. This is where you will this will shape the campaign. This is where the candidates are going to go. This is where they're going to spend the money. This is where they're going to and and one of the things that you'll you'll also see is that there's going to be more likely that they're going to emphasize state focused issues uh, in these states as opposed to what we might think as, as national issues. It appears that <clears throat> there really uh, may be uh, two major national issues in this campaign, and one is immigration, and the other is the issue of abortion or uh, health care for women. Uh, other than that, the, the issues are going to be, tend to be focused on statewide issues in these particular states. And anyway, you, you get a, you see how close the election is. And also, <clears throat> not only is the, is the election really close, but what happened in very close elections is that the outcome, the outcome is determined by changes in small margins. And, and by small margins, we mean uh, the, the turnout. One of the things that has been characteristic of the primary season so far has been <clears throat> uh, the uh, apathetic nature of the voters. Voter turnout has been very, very low uh, and they've been very low in particular uh, uh, among, uh, across the board, uh, but they have been particularly low uh, in, on the Democratic side, perhaps because there's been no competition, but even on the Republican side as well. If you look at the low turnout of, of the, uh, the Biden coalition of four years ago, uh, the youth vote has been very, uh, very low. If you look at the, the uh, turnout of, of, of minority groups, uh, it has been very low. And so one of the things that to look for is, is the, the impact and the turnout of, of small changes in, in elections like this, what, by small changes, I mean three, four, five percent of the vote. For instance, as an example, uh, four years ago, 
the youth vote uh, in, uh, in, in the Biden election, uh, he got 62% of the youth vote. Well, uh, he's going to need uh, that uh, uh, to win the election. And right now, the youth vote is, is, is just, you know, it, and my guess is it's the age issue uh, with, with Biden. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and another factor, is, or at least in, in the, in the uh, turnout issue, at least on the Republican side, is that normally once a candidate, again, this is true regardless of the party, they tend to expand their, try to expand their base. In other words, that they tend to run, uh, in the Republican side, they tend to run uh, more conservative to appeal to their base, uh, and the Democrats tend to run a little bit more liberal to appeal to their base. And once they win the nomination, they tend to widen that particular base. Well, at least it's been uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that former President Trump ha has really uh, not attempted at all to widen his base. In other words, uh, he even uh, declined and didn't want anything to do with uh, former Governor uh, Nikki Haley's vote. And so uh, th this seems to be kind of, uh, would be odd to me, again, because elections are determined by the change of, of very small margins. Anyway, keep this in mind. Uh, <clears throat> money, organization, these are going to be some of the factors that are going to impact the election. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I think that he realizes that this Christian nationalist vote that you're probably fundamentalist would be evangelical perhaps. Uh, it, 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 he's losing support there and that's why he's added the religious tone to uh, the, and the... the um, Hawking of Bibles, you know, uh, that, 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 that would be my guess. Is at one of the things that, that, talking again about the small margins, uh, and I don't know how much time we have left, I'm 45 minutes in. Uh, one of the things that becomes very critical is the internal support within the Republican and Democratic Party. In other words, that both candidates need at least 90% of self-proclaimed Republicans, self-proclaimed Democrats to support their candidate. And if, if they fall below that number, they're, they're in serious trouble. And so I think that's the reason he's, he, his, they're doing, po look, they're doing polling every day. They know what's going on with their base. They know uh, that what they need to do to, to win the election. And so by adding this, as you suggested, this religious aspect or element, I think he thinks that he already has it. He had it. So it's not like, uh, and I think he needs to hold on to it. And, and that's why he, He's got the uh, the Bible and the Christian appeal to the Christian uh, majority. In, in um, April last year, my husband and I switched from Democratic Party to the Republican Party in order to vote in the primary in Florida. My question is, should we now look at those states and 
maybe pick Pennsylvania as our home state, what do we need to do to vote in Pennsylvania? <laughs> Move there. Um, just a comment about changing your um, vote to no party affiliation. Uh, that's not going to allow you to vote in either party in the primary then. So um, I, I, I don't know what your, your objection, I, I don't know where you are either, so I didn't, but uh, anyway, um, that, that, that's not going to give you an advantage uh, to, to vote for or against some particular candidate. Yeah. There's uh, been discussion about uh, the failure of uh, approval of the electors in six different states. Could you discuss that matter? In other words, if there's a, if there's a rejection or uh, if, if they fail in the six states to approve the electors, what are the options? What are the legal aspects of it? What can be done? Well, as I mentioned earlier, that there's, there's, it's a Byzantine process that leaves a lot open to the unknown. And um, what, what could happen is, and there are lots of options, but one of them uh, could be that the state legislature chooses different electors. Remember, the electors have to be uh, chosen uh, and approved by the state legislature. And so if you had unfaithful electors, the, the, the state could override those and potentially. And anyway, let me, let me give you four examples where the Electoral College uh, didn't serve us particularly well, even though and I don't want to necessarily, you know, most of the time in the 240 years, the Electoral College has worked without much uh, problems, but there have been four circumstances that have presented uh, a different result. And the first was um, the disputed election was in 1800 between Jefferson and Adams. Uh, <coughs> the, again, not only with, with uh, Washington, but the, uh, there was no popular vote and the state legislators appointed the electors. Uh, and there was a tie in the electoral college. It went to the House of Representatives and Jefferson was chosen after 36 ballots in the House of Representatives. And so if you think that there you know, were recent times of controversy Think of the wheeling and dealing that, that took place then uh, after 36 attempts at choosing who the president uh, was going to be. And then uh, in uh, 1824, there was a four-way race, Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, and William Crawford. And this is the process where when you have four major candidates, no one's going to get a majority in the Electoral College, and so it automatically is going to be thrown to the House of Representatives. Well, it, what happened was in the Electoral College, John Quincy Adams won, even though he did not win the popular vote. And this raises the question that I alluded to a little bit earlier, and that is, what, what I think is the real reason we have the Electoral College, and that is, I think that the Founding Fathers wanted the House of Representatives to always pick. I think that they thought that there would be lots of candidates, like here in, in 1824, that there would be a lot of candidates who would be, wanted to be president and that way, it would go to the House of Representatives. And, and <clears throat> why do I think that? Well, in addition to having, think, there were no political parties to speak of. And so by not having 
what has happened, we've had two political parties somewhat automatically got a major or all but four times, automatically got the majority in the Electoral College. Well, the House of Representatives also has the power to remove the president in the impeachment, or at least initiate the impeachment process. House of Representatives also was the only chamber elected by the people. Uh, the senators were originally chosen by state legislatures, and of course, the judiciary is, is still appointed by the president and, and the U.S. Senate. And also, the House of Representatives controls the budget. And, well, they control the taxes. And so I think that they saw the House of Representatives as, as in, in addition to these other issues that I mentioned at the start, I think that they wanted to have the House of Representatives always pick the President of the United States. And it just hasn't worked out that way because we have developed into a two-party system. Anyway, let me move on real quickly, and uh, I don't want to keep you from your Sunday activities. There, there were... Uh-oh. Uh, in, yeah, in 76, and this is a really somewhat of a prelude to what we saw four years ago, in, there were four states... Uh, there, there were four states which charged uh, a fraud. And, you know, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Florida was one of them. Uh, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, uh, they sent a separate two slates of electors to the uh, Washington, D.C. At that time, the House and the Senate were controlled by different parties. Instead of sending, so they couldn't, they couldn't agree on uh, sending the uh, vote to the House of Representatives. So what they did was they appointed a commission. They appointed a commission to resolve the differences and make a long story short why Hayes was elected by one vote. And there was, again, a considerable controversy uh, changes of vote, uh, appointments of judges. It was, it was uh, uh, this is a, an election that uh, really does not give much, uh, much attention. But I think this was the premise for the Trump forces uh, four years ago uh, to hold on to the presidency. He thought if there were, I think, he thought if there were fraud in uh, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Arizona, and, and Pennsylvania, that, and he used the pressure, uh, that we, we know that, uh, to have them uh, send different electors and even have the vice president not approve that it, the election would go to the House and he, of course, the House was controlled by Republicans. He would be, that would be his path to holding on to the office. And one other uh, was the 2000 election that we uh, alluded to uh, in which um, George Bush won the plurality. He did not win the majority by 537 popular votes here in Florida gave him all of the, uh, at that time, 28 electoral college votes in Florida. That gave him 271 electoral college votes, and he was sworn in on January 20th. And Let, let me uh, let me just say, and, I, and I'm, you know, if, if you leave, uh, it happens with my students all the time. So please uh, feel free to leave. But if anyone would like a copy of this 
uh, send me an email and I will uh, forward you a copy of um, the slides. And I'll happy, I can answer questions. Uh, the women's basketball tournament is at three o'clock. I'm, I'm, I'm free till 11. Uh, I mean, I'm free to uh, till 2.30 uh, so I can make it home to watch it. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, my question is, are there any polls uh, that you're aware of <clears throat> that are indicating uh, what the projection is for the people who are saying, I'm not going to vote for either candidate and what the outcome of the election would be as a result of that? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, but keep in mind that polling um, uh, is an art that has some science associated with it. And it also is a snapshot at that particular time. And so things will change, but excuse me, between now and then, um, when, when there, 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 it perhaps raises a, a bigger point. In, and again, I think a signif very significant one is what's going to happen to the undecided, the independent, uh, as someone mentioned, the no party affiliation. Th that, that will be one of the keys in the outcome of the election. Four years ago, that particular group who self-proclaimed independence, 55%, I think, or more, uh, may have been slightly more, voted for Biden. And that, that uh, was one of the factors that led to him, him, him winning. In other words, if you, you would categorize some of the, the subgroups that uh, made a difference for Biden, it would be the unity of the Democratic Party. Uh, the, not that the, high, the youth vote was high, but the percentage of the youth vote was high. Minority turnout was also very high, and then the independents. So, uh, and, and suburban women, uh, overwhelmingly suburban uh, women, uh, th those were really the core to Biden's victory uh, four years ago. Uh, and, and the undecided were, were not quite as large. I had a question on ranked choice voting. If that were to be adopted in a general election, would that supplant the uh, Electoral College or not? Any thoughts on that? It could, but um, I, I, again, I don't see that happening. Remember, the, 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 the process of the Electoral College is really controlled by the political parties, and they're not going to give up their authority or power to a, a rank choice. Um, and so... Yeah, it could, uh, but to be frank, uh, I haven't really given a deep thought of the implications of it, uh, to be honest. If, if we wanted to donate money, uh, would it make sense, pardon me? If, if we wanted to donate money, would it make sense to send it to the party in one of those up for grab states? Well, humility uh, re requires me to hold back uh, where to send your money, but <laughs> um, it, it wouldn't make any difference if you, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, you know, you, 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 do it in Florida, you know. See, and have some. Try to have some impact here. You won't have much impact in Collier County. I can tell you that. Uh, that uh, you know, that there's um, you know lost souls uh, uh, here. Um, what is the basis for validity of polls today, when many of us refuse to uh, answer our uh, cell phone. 
Well, th there's, that's a great question, and um, you, you have to be, let me just give you a couple of pointers to when you consider polling. Uh, first of all, who did the polling? Who paid for the polling? Who did they poll? In other words, is it a general population? Is it registered voters? Uh, is it likely voters? Uh, and what was the sample size? And I know this is kind of complicated, but um, the polling is reveals something, but it in m many ways conceals the truth. And so uh, you just have to have to be somewhat skeptical of, uh, not skeptical, but look at it. The, the best way to look at polling, I think, is to look at it over a trend. Look, look at it from reliable polls and, and, and don't take one poll and, say, and make up your mind and say, okay, this is, this is the reality that, uh, of, of the, and what was the question asked? And, in a, and as you have suggested, what, what was the method that they used to poll? Uh, uh, cell phones, landlines, face to face. Uh, so it, it's, it's really more complicated than it, it perhaps seems on the surface. I, I, I don't know yeah. if that helped or not. But. Yes, thank you so much for an outstanding and enlightening educational uh, presentation. I, I do have a, a question. I know that you have highlighted two issues that you uh, think are extremely important in the upcoming election that we're aware of, and that's reproductive rights for women and also the immigration issue. But is it naive of somebody to think that perhaps the survival of our democracy might not be important, even to, as a kitchen table issue? Perhaps uh, that's yeah, naive. Uh, it, it could be, yeah. I, I have, I guess, um, not, not to think that it isn't, but um, I guess I have uh, faith in, in the process, uh, even though sometimes my faith is challenged. Uh, and, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about that, the, the, the democratic issue and, um, you know, particularly, you know, frankly, if Trump wins, you know, he, he has this authoritarian streak to him. I mean, and perhaps more than a streak, you know, it, it may be, it, it may be a flood. So. Okay, on that cheery note, uh, we will, we will well, end our don't, presentation. Don't, don't uh, <laughs> be sure to vote and uh, be active. Um, anyway, thank you for all. I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, I've always enjoyed it. Um, and um, maybe after the election, uh, I can come back and um, give you my insights of yeah, give us a wrap-up at that time. Yeah. If there is an after-election, uh, <laughs> and who won and why. Thank you. Thank you.